Good afternoon. It's my privilege this afternoon to introduce Steve DiPaolo, uh, a graphics uh, worker that I had the uh, good fortune to work with many, many years ago at New York Institute of Technology, where we, uh, we had the uh, opportunity to um, participate in some really pioneering efforts in graphics. Uh, Steve has done a lot since then, mainly in the field of uh, interactive graphics, and uh, I'm uh, quite as excited to see his recent work as uh, I hope you are. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I'm going to talk about uh, artificial intelligence and digital media. That's quite a, uh, a big range uh, title, so I will be talking about a subset of that, and I'll immediately discuss what subset I think is somewhat reasonable. My background is I, uh, I was at, uh, I'm now at uh, Simon Fraser University at a school that actively mixes a scientist and artist. So we're, we're kind of a computer science school that allows artists and designers in, a little less math, a little less computer science, but other than that, it would be that way. Uh, but we do have a very significant master's and PhD program, so it really is trying to show what interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary research can do. Um, I do have a, I was down here seven years ago for seven years uh, in industry a bit, uh, at a, uh, running a part of the advanced technology group at EA in Foster City, I guess it's in San Mateo now. Um, and, and then on some startups doing VR world. So I, I readily admit with that AI name at the top there that my background and my strength is more in interactivity, uh, graphics, and simulation. And some of that simulation has put me in some parts of the AI space. And uh, I, do, I do find I make things and then make art with those things. And I learn from both ways. And I'll discuss a little bit of that. So um, what was on the abstract was out there to kind of poke a little bit uh, by saying, by using parameterized techniques which model a knowledge space of a given social or cognitive process, it is possible to use AI techniques such as neural networks and genetic programming to create new types of things. And those things are quite wide, but here I have visualization uh, creation tools, search tools, and expression tools. And notice at least I use that word tools or symbol uh, or systems because that's, that's one of the benefits, I think, uh, that these kinds of parameterization techniques help with, that they create a space. And within that space, as long as you have a little bit of knowledge of that space, you can move through it or have your user move through it in slightly different ways. Um, so the disclaimer, again, on, on AI, uh, uh, again, it's, it's a... It's a big and beat up field in many, many ways, and I surely get beat up daily on parts of it. So I wanted to at least uh, clarify uh, what I do and where I come from. I'm, I don't really like it, but I occasionally use the term computational intelligence, and at least that, that actually has a definition, which fits me for my triple E, which, uh, as you can read, um, kind of favors this more biological, linguistically motivated paradigm. So it emphasizes, and again, I've taken this right from the definition, and the things in yellow, can you see them as yellow? Not really. OK, so there's orange and yellow up there, but I think that's a little bit of everything. Um, uh, the things that I'm mo mostly involved in is neural networks and genetic uh, and evolutionary systems, a little bit of fuzzy uh, logic stuff. Um, uh, another definition kind of says it shies away, it says rejects here, but what you say shies away from statistical methods. So we're, we're, how I would push that is kind of bringing up this kind of Turing test side of things, which is from the biological side, I'm kind of interested in what really happens and mimicking, let's say, a cognitive system. So, I, uh, so I'm interested in that even, even if it does it very simply, it is in fact trying to be intelligent as opposed to appearing to be intelligent. Uh, so th I think that would be my definition. Uh, I, I'd be very clear that that doesn't mean it's better than just satisfying the Turing test, because usually in, try in, in trying to be intelligent, you're doing it in a much simpler way. And, that's, and these are, on the bottom here are some of the, the groups that are involved with things like that, and, and people that I'm working with in Cambridge. It's the Rainbow Research Lab at, at, UC, at University College London. It's uh, Peter Bentley who does a lot with evolutionary art systems, and I've stolen a good part of my genetic system from, from York. So this idea of parameterized, because that's the heart of at least the, the kind of style that I try and do. So let's imagine that there's a soft knowledge space of 
of anything, but let's, you're sitting on chairs, so let's say modern chair design, the space of all types of modern chairs, or the space of face types, that there's some domain, and within it there's, there's uh, in some correlated way, all face types, or the behavior space of whales, which is a little bit more tricky to analyze, or the emotion space of music, those last three at least we'll be talking through a bit. So to do that, you want to first have to get that information, which, which is in art all in itself, and have some papers just trying to get at it, either a scientist or an artist, you know, what they do, whether it's deep understanding of wells or how they paint a the painting. Uh, but once you get that in some soft way, that you need to, to quantify it for, in a computer system, and, the te and there's many techniques there, and this is where I'm starting to limit space, and the technique that I used because it's actually quite big in the in, uh, facial graphics where I came from and ge uh, generative systems as well, is this parameterized techniques where you, where you try and define a set of factors whose values determine the characteristic of the system. So you're really making these, these axes. You're claiming that, OK, th these are the really, in, if there are some parameters that really speak to the want and need of a beluga whale, this would be a good way to limit that. Uh, and what's nice about that is uh, it can be quite a, if you do it in a certain way, it's quite a complete space. You're not interpolating data in between good data points. It's, it all should be good data. It all should be resolution dependent. Uh, I could pick anywhere in this space and get uh, an individual. Let's, let's use the, the face technique uh, idea that it, th these parameters could literally be the types of muscles uh, that you need for, for facial animation. And with that, you can get uh, a face with a particular gesture in that point, whether you can pick anywhere to do that. Um, again, this parameterized technique surely has some strong historical mathematical perspective to it. I come in from uh, gen uh, generative systems and CG. Um, again, there, there are some other areas that also use this term that I'm, I'm not doing as much, so principal component analysis. and I. I I claim at least that that's a little bit more statistical than this knowledge side that, I, that I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to be very semantic, knowledge-based, content-driven. So I'm going to back up one more time and say that, as it says in my bio, I'm an artist scientist. So, um, so I'm going to be a little bit, and for speed, because I'm going to try and go through a lot of things, I'm going to be a little bit light with these terms. If, if you want to scream out something right in the middle of my talk or talk to me afterwards. So note that I don't know the full range of the audience. So to try and jam a lot of stuff at you, I'm, I'm not going to get into deep details of what the differences are. But feel free to correct if you, uh, the artist side of me to uh, educate the science side of me. So again, why I like it, it's complete. It's mathematically rigorous. It's unitized. So I'm not trying to make these low-level parameters so they're, they're good for users to use. I'm actually trying to create the lowest set of them that would be the words that I can make sentences out of. With that, I know there's no exception rules, there's no errors, there's no dead space in the resolution. I usually make them unitized, so they're very easy, they're, they're associative, they have very good properties. I could just use them over and over again and put more and more on top of them, and generally, I don't have to worry about them breaking. That, that's at least what I'm interested in. With that, I get in the idea of hierarchical parameter space. So here we are again, let's claim we're in this space of faces. Now, how low level do you go? This is where I push this cognitive or perceptual level. I don't actually, if we're talking about facials, faces, muscles might be a good place to go. There's a finite number of them. If you had all of them with some other biological ideas of how faces work, you wouldn't need any more. That's the key, is when you're doing something complicated, you don't want to have to add new low level parameters. So how low do I go? Well, because I'm really doing, I, I'm interested in a perception and cognition way. I don't go to individual muscles. Why? We can't move individual muscles. You know, Ekman, who's, who's right up here at, uh, at UCSF, proved long ago with the facial action coding system that perceptually we, we, can, we, we tend to work in a series of muscles. That makes sense then for me to borrow as a computer scientist and say, that's low enough for me because I now can extract data from, from other sources, biological and, sci and psychological. With that said, I would say we have corner mouth up and down. So what would be this higher line, this A? Well, let's say we move up to the next level. Rather than a word, it's a phrase. That phrase could be something really obvious 
I mean a semantic phrase in this case would be smile. So I at least could, so smile is moving the corner up, maybe bringing the nose out, opening the eyes slightly. So you can see that I simply have an expression here. So this way, this is the hierarchical notion that I could build up higher and higher level semantic constructs from these low levels. That's why it's important to make the low level, you know, um, as, as, uh, as complete and compact as possible. Now, um, right, a next level would be joyousness. So how would you do joyousness? Damn, that's happiness and smile over time reacting to other parameters. So at least the point is I can keep moving up this and know that, let's just claim, at frame time over, over the wire, I'm only, the semantics really can happen locally or on the server, and I'm always only deriving back to these, to these low-level parameters. Sometimes, though, it's in a multi-dimensional space. So I'll show you some work that I did for The Sims, where I implemented a version of this. And they were in a phase space, but they always thought, oh, this is like Spiro Agnew with a gangster. And they would trade that with somebody else. And people thought they were in gangster space. So that knowledge space is a stereotypic superhero gangster kind of space. And they, they, they would hope when they moved these axes, they would be moving through that space. In fact, they weren't. They were moving much lower. But we could build that on top. And you could imagine many, mother, many, many other uh, valid face spaces, all of them uh, 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 learning from each other, but multidimensional in that they don't, they don't just hierarchical down. But in fact, gangster space is different from, hey, you know, we're all out of Africa. It's, it's quite being proof now, and you can get your blood tested. In fact, you can see migration. And with that migration, you literally can see how faces change. That would be a, a whole nother face that surely would have, uh, where you could move between that and gangster space. But surely those would be uh, uh, uncorrelated, but would move down to the same. So that's what I mean by multidimensional as well. Uh, so that knowledge, I only do in a particular area. The area that I'm interested in, again, is more this human and social centric. So I like to think of it as expression systems, as communication, but communication with a little oomph, with a little emotion, with a little reasoning uh, in, in, in this human way uh, can be considered expression or other things. So with that, again, more cognitive living systems approach, I'm interested in character systems, uh, but as well as encoding social and human expression. So that would be voice, gesture, expression, emotion. And then you can imagine some of the dimensions kind of above that are creativity, personality. Interesting, once you are in spaces like that, you can map them easily to each other. So you can go from one data set to another one. So that's this, this idea of remapping implicit knowledge. Um, and then this is some of the areas I do it with. I pack the slides kind of heavy knowing that they'll be around. And I wanted to go more wide in the talk. So I'm going to blow through some slides quickly. So if you see something, so you can either read fast um, or um, I'll look at it later if there's an area that's more interesting to you. So obviously, this kind of work is interdisciplinary. It sits heavily on, on computer science, in my case, graphics and AI and math. But that, that makes a system that I have to pour content in, or at least under that's the knowledge part. So I, I work a lot with cognition, with psychologists and sociologists. And I tend to need a design process to extract data, because in fact, they don't give me whale data exactly the way my neural network and action selection system works. So, and they're busy. They're, science, they're zoologists worrying about these whales. So some of the techniques is also how to, how to uh, get them to open up in a certain way. Uh, by the way, the problem with, quote, scientists is the answer back I get almost all the time is, we don't know that yet. So I, uh, in the case of the whale stuff, I go, uh, his name is Lance as well. I said, Lance, I've done my homework. There's only eight of you in the world in that you run a research center in, an, in a very large aquarium where there are eight beluga whales. So if you don't know, no one knows. And I'm just modeling. So from nothingness to ant to beluga, let's do this again. Explain to me the biomechanics of the fluke, because you have to know something. Often they know it, and they've seen it. I go, I've seen it. And they'll say, well, that's in captivity. I, I know, I know. But we can extrapolate from, you know. So scientists tend to want the real answer, where I'm coming in, as you can see, kind of top down. Artists, by the way, which I do a lot of work with, too, 
um, tend to talk about everything but it. So, oh, so how do you do that jazz saxophone thing? Well, you know, I eat a good breakfast, I get up, the magic comes, and then I go, okay, so let's go back to the magic part. Can we, can we talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, it comes, okay, good. So, so it isn't there, and it, you know, I mean, even comes, you can say, okay, so, it, so it's fast, okay, I get that, so it's, you know, and is it based on you eating well or going to the desert? For the, so they, um, so some of them don't mind it, some of them we throw you out of the room because you are now challenging their muse and that muse might go away if you ask every question. I play a little bit and if somebody wants to ask me why I do that funny pinky thing that sounds pretty good, again, this is a cognitive issue. Uh, for me to stop and have to go down and think about that pinky thing, that's, you know, again, a lot of this from, from, from psychology and cognition work. Actually, our cognition, how we think, is at a, is at a hertz that is slower than all the things we, we can think about. So our brain is actually getting plenty of information, deciding things, and only some of that goes to our awareness. So the tree, and the awareness is trying to keep track of way too much stuff. So if you kind of are poking the awareness to kind of go down and tell me about the pinky thing, when in fact it's somewhat automatic, and what the awareness is doing is I'm at Carnegie Hall, and this is going good, and I'm going to change it today. If he, if he has to remind himself that I reminded him that he does that pinky thing that no one else does, he could lose it right then and there. So that's an issue. The other thing, they tend to talk in their craft. So you know, with artists, I bring this up, and they go, well, you know, I use thallo blue in, the, in this bristle brush. And I say, well, you're using thallo blue. I said, every one of your pictures, because the one before that is on the other side. So you're doing cool to warm colors. That's your rule. But they go, well, whatever. You know, and they won't. So sometimes you have to figure out how to extract that out. So, um, so there is a paper, if you're interested, if, you've, if, if that's been an issue for you too, there is, a, there is a paper with the whale stuff and with artists on uh, more of a design paper on that design process. Um, one way I'm going to show it to you is with a work that I have a lot in, but I'm going to try going through it quick, but it at least demonstrates, is, uh, is facial systems. So, uh, so if I have a facial system and I have to pour, and I don't just want a facial system about the polygons or, or the pixels of, of faces, but actually faces that are emotional and alive and aware and have moods, um, uh, that's what I'm interested in. With that, we can get expressive uh, user interface and, and better, you know, and other things. I find that the data isn't there. So one of the things I'm doing is building these systems and giving them to psychologists for fundamental work. And from that fundamental work in face communication and expression and meaning, I get good data back. I get, I get papers just for doing that alone. And I get good data back. So I find, I think you guys are familiar with this here at Google, that sometimes you really are doing both. You're, you're getting some fundamental data, even though you're using it uh, within your systems. And then within that, it's, it's, it's good for a number of, of learning systems and games, and I'll show you some of that. Again, it uses this technique. It's knowledge-based, right? I, it's, it's the postscript of faces. Postscript revolutionized the desktop printing by saying it's not all just dots. There are something there's something semantically special about a line and text. Why don't we actually object-orientedly write for that? So that's what we're doing for face. I have a paper just on facial multimedia object where I'm trying to claim just like video is an object, why isn't a face an object? Computers are at a level now where we can now talk semantically and move semanticness around rather than just trying to keep the semantic in our heads and, and, and kind of write in, in buffers and data structures. Um, so then the face area and the features actually dictate. So I would less, would, less resources, less polygons, less CPU happens in the forehead that happens in the mouth, because why would, because that's actually how it is in our systems as well. Um, so again, you get these low level right, you build up these, they're encapsulated, it's clean. Um, I've done a lot of this, especially during my boom year time down here in, in startups dealing with agents and avatars and in, at, at, at Muse, we did a full 3D browser that had, um, that could put, uh, you know, Google and anything else on the walls and have characters. Uh, that work is out there if you're interested. I, I, I'm going to shy away from that because it's less AI oriented. And I'm going to talk at least about uh, putting AI into the system a little bit. So the first place that I did, and I'm somewhat proud that I think it's one of the first commercial applications in a game of, of at least a kind of a newer AI system, which was for The Sims. So in The Sims, uh, I was at EA and, and left, and I was at Stanford this time, and Will Wright called me up and say, 
you want to do a face system for us for free? And I said, no, and we negotiated. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, it, uh, and if this was an academic audience, because they don't think it's possible, at least I have this down here. <laughs> and EA is, one of, is really hard. Hi, EA out there, if this is on uh, YouTube. Um, they're not, they're uh, game companies as well as other companies are somewhat control oriented. So the idea that it might be open source and then in fact I'd want to, that I'd continue doing research of it was an issue, but we did get monies out of them. I don't know that they'd, I'm not saying what that K means. So that's, um, so you can really kind of work with institute, again, you do this stuff all the time. In other places, this, this is hard to do. It was actually quite hard. Actually, we finished the entire project, uh, Will Wright and I, because he's really, into, by the way, the AI side. Um, and Willie was a contributor. We finished the entire project before EA was able to write a, uh, a, no, a, a contract that was uh, non-exclusive, which means I could still use it and they can still use it. So it was a lot. But that, that work is around from that. And it, I, I think, nothing to do with Spore, but I think it did affect folks with that you don't have to build. So in the old days of gaming, if I could say it that way, before this stuff, um, you got Laura Croft, an artist made Laura Croft, you had to be Laura Croft. Now, with a number of user-oriented systems, you can pick who you want to be, uh, which is good for them. They get user creation. It's good for you because it's exactly who you want. Uh, you don't know how to be, know how to build faces or Laura Croft nests. So the point is to get in an art or an expression system talent from the artist, but then the user moves through it. So I know you guys are somewhat familiar with this. Um, for speed, I'm going to leave out the system. It's a, I could bring it up. It's a standard uh, uh, kind of Carl Sims oriented genetic system. With it, I'm able to move. So then imagine now a space of all the possible faces uh, of the level of the Sims at the time um, that I can move through it in different ways. I can start here and kind of wig my area around. It's a very different. They're actually searching rather than creating faces. It's quite good because they tend to make their own face and they make the they, they make the face they think they look like, as opposed to uh, um, uh, you know, what they actually really do look like. And I'm always saying, being a face guy, and they're always saying, well, just make it really like them. I'm always saying in the morning, at night, what he used to look like, what his fans think he looks like. You know, this idea that, that reality is, in fact, not reality, that, that, it's, that there's even an optical capture, which, which people consider reality, video and photography, is just optical. It's actual archive. It's how we looked in a mood, in a light scheme. You know, and, uh, so part of it is to try and move around that. What's great about this is thousands of people were using this. And when they did find that gangster, they would give it, and they wouldn't be giving the picture of the gangster or the 3D model of the gangster. They would be getting the, the pointer into gangster space, which allowed other people to then go find other ones. You could take these, and you could breed them together. So if somebody made something interesting, they'd breed it with other ones. So normally, I explain genetic programming uh, for time. I think most of you know it. I might talk about it in more detail in something else. But just imagine now that so the idea that a space is correlated, it's complete, it's, you know, it's algorithmic. Uh, again, it's, uh, 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 it's easy to customize and make it goal-oriented with that multi-space idea. The low-level stuff always is there, but you could build these outer layers that you can play with a little bit. So the low-level gives you full range. The high-level um, is where you can start putting more cognitive uh, uh, con constructs on. So if this isn't clear, I'm going to try it one more time. Jazz saxophone, I want to do this trick. How am I going to do that with jazz saxophone? Well, even though there's this guy who's Mr. Jazz saxophone with I used to say, I'm old enough where I used to say trumpet and bring up Miles Davis, and he was alive. And, but, like, so I switched to jazz saxophone. Um, even though he does the same thing all the time, none of that information is sitting in the saxophone, right? It's all on his side. Now, it's sitting there because the saxophone gets, used to gets wears in certain ways and things. Wouldn't it be nice if some of that, again, this idea of a system, could go into the saxophone? I always do that, just do that thing, and I could go on a little bit more automatic. All of that automatic is actually in the lower part of your brain doing the finger, that the muscle memory and all these other things. But some of it could go on the system. So how would you build something like that? Well, I, the way I would do it is I'd be incredibly scientific. Every sound that could come out of a jazz saxophone, I would sample. I would sample a little bit of how the screech, the this. I would understand it in some space. So now I could make a space of everything that could ever come out. Now, if I did that space randomly over time, so that you might call that music, um, at least in every one of those spaces is every song ever created from that jazz saxophone. It's worthless. So now the next step is I got words. So now I go to the jazz saxophone guy and say, that screech thing. 
I, you only, you do it, so tell me about that, because now I'm trying to build up an expression, right? Um, it's really hard to get right, which is why I use this technique. Just get the low level, slowly build, you know, get credit, and then move it up. So that, again, that, that really is important for the whole rest of the talk, because that at least is the technique I use for everything I do in emotion space. And uh, we talked about face type, but not facial emotion and expression. Uh, again, this idea of a functional, uh, you know, that we have a paper on this idea, and I think if I could throw things, occasionally I'm going to be saying things I don't typically say, knowing I'm in front of a Google audience of very smart people saying that I, I think this is important, this idea that you, you decide that there's a semantic object that you're doing anyway, but, and there's some data structure and ability to do, it's time to start calling it that semantic object and rethink everything, data structures and resources about how that object makes sense. I can't, you know, I could just say in some funny way, I can't believe in the year 2008, with all of us evolved and living and breathing and marrying and breeding based on face communication and the, how long this computer has been around, that we don't have a tool that does everything about faces and is actually married that way when we're still kind of have one on the desktop metaphor and other things. So I, I think there's probably other really interesting spaces to think through that. And then think about standards. So we, we're at least somewhat tied to the MPEG-4 standard. It doesn't give us enough. And I, we have a, so the idea then, if we can have this system that knows everything about faces, and it's a very different way than they make faces at Pixar and, and game companies now. And I'm down here because I'm at the Game Developers Conference talking to, to gaming people about this kind of stuff. We claim we can make any face uh, uh, with any emotion, and we can move it from, and they'll know it, this, this kind of cartoon but 3D guy talks out of the side of his mouth and has a big mouth and a big jaw. Because we're not just point set interpolating or anything like that, um, you put any animation from anywhere on him and he should conceivably do the right thing. So in this case, we have this, I think this, I call this neutral maybe. Uh, so his neutral is still kind of a weird dopey neutral, right? So the dopiness is not in the animation, it's in the character, right? Um, and you can see that. Uh, yeah, so there's a, this newer IEEE paper talks a little bit to, to standardizing some of this stuff. There's an MPEG-7 thing coming up that does this a little bit better, but there's papers out there on this. Um, people have, so people have moods and they have personalities. So if, if, if I'm a happy, excited guy, that's my personality. If I've given too many talks this week, my mood, and I'm tired and I'm at GDC and there's just too many parties, the mood is gonna affect that, but this is transient, right? Uh, if in fact I'm being a sales bot system, the knowledge is get to know the guy, find out his likes and dislikes, get him in conversation, use his likes and dislikes to figure out what kind of car he wants and, and to what kind of persuasion you're gonna use, and it's kind of standard. So that would be the knowledge, like you know, if we were saying it's a car salesman, but he, you, he might do it in this kind of hippie kind of way. He might, so the personality is different and the idea of separating these, and actually a lot of some of this research was borrowed from Barbara Hayes Roth here at, um, at Stanford, who, who's done a lot of this. Um, Quickly, I should show you things moving. So if this stuff works, forget about the faces, this whole idea of parameterizing. So, so again, if we had a picture of a face, that's nice. It's just pixels. And pixels don't know, I mean, they know they're pixels, and they know if a blur routine comes down, and they can, you can do some other statistical things, but they're not, they're not faces. If we go to the next level, we'd say up in parameterization, we go at least vector. So now we're at least vector, we can do some pulling and pushing. Now if we had, quote, smart vector, we have even more. So imagine moving up that scale. So if it really is smart, I should be able to, it should know about faceness. So one test is I should be able to poke it. And instead of poking it and it blurs, if it was pictures or whatever you want to do, it should act like a face. One way to poke it is uh, with data. So I'll send data through it, and the data I'll send through it for speed here is, is voice data, since that actually matches. So uh, real time on an older laptop, it's gonna be a delay, things are breaking. Uh, we have a newer system that's a bit faster and better looking, but here we go. La. So that's me talking through the face, and you know, in 10 milliseconds I'm doing a lip sync, but I'm also doing some level of gesture, and I'm talking way too loud because it really is looking at energy and it's overly excited because <laughs> I'm giving a talk. So if I talk lower and occasionally adjust, 
push something, or just do that eyebrow thing. So it, it actually finds some, some qualities of voice. And this is one way of talking. I said any behavior, so let's switch this behavior and let's go to alien. Still my voice, still this face. So am I there? Yes, I am not looking at you anymore. I've come to take over your planet. And I'm just acting a bit different than I did. There you go. There was just funny, weird, not really paying attention kind of neck things. Uh, if I went nervous, it's not a great nervous. It's a grad student art programming nervous. It's very easy to kind of do something and say, nervous. And you're going, OK, do we have any psychological validation that this? But anyway, um, well, one thing you do with nervous is, are you going to be nervous? Yeah. Is you, you don't do much back and forth. You hold your neck muscles tight. So it's a little bit more up and down in your blank. So this is at least the, the, the idea for it. Uh, uh, so like I said, it's then it, it doesn't matter the character type. I could do it for any character type. I, uh, in fact, I don't even have to be keep it human if I don't want to. So I'll go to cartoon. Oops. I went, to, I, went to, I went to cartoon that had that mixed half of, of, of African-American women in it. That's why it looked weird, because it didn't completely clear the buffer. So there's cartoon. So here I am. I'm at Stanford. I pick any face I want. I'm a grad student. I hit on the buttons to call mom, because this could, it's, just a, it's just 80 floats. It goes over the, no matter how much we make it complicated, in the end of the day, it's just the low-level things. And I say, hey, mom. Uh, I'm a cartoony today, so there's squash and stretch in there. Right? It doesn't matter, but it's it's being affected by the voice. And uh, you know, it's expensive here at Stanford, and I could I could really use your money. So so I don't know how to say this, but send me money now. And and if you don't, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn into Buzz Lightyear and I'm gonna fly over there. I'm gonna pick right down the block. And uh, uh, but please send me money or I'll fade away. So I'm actually just hitting keystrokes that map to things. But just to be clear, this is just data. So those keystrokes could be program control. That could be commander so-and-so saying, get out now. Open the door. They're coming. And you don't. So then you can get louder still. And we could even know if that particular guy you picked is more stoic rather than screamy, he would go, now. And you would know, oh, crap. He really means it. So, so people have different personalities. We could map that all under program control. The hope is we could make games. Oh, yep. I've learned learned that no one ever listens to a thing I say if, if that thing is still talking. It's just, it's just going like that. Um, so the hope is we can make dramatically subtle emotional faces like in movies and really change what the game industry is. Is that a question? Yeah. Got to say it loud. Um, so this is, this is interesting. It would um, provide some sort of advantage for, for communication, but it's trying to infer all visual communication from the vocal. It seems like this would be particularly this would be more useful if you could record the information in this format and actually transmit that compressed facial expression. That's right. So 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 could, I would say could, this is middle. Could you repeat the question? Sorry what? Could you repeat the question? Uh, I guess I think I can. So this is interesting, but it would be better if more of the semantics of what someone's trying to communicate is also compressed, not just the face side of it. Was that, would, would, was that some? That you record and compress the facial expression rather than trying to be constructed from the vocal. Aha. Uh -huh. that's, that's it. So that you record the facial expression, because that's real. That's the person is. And, and I'm here to tell you that all the power to you, it's just not the way. Uh, I, 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 would, I could argue with you forever over this, that that is not the person. The person is the soul. You know, you have, you have a, you got somebody's real belief in his real soul, and then somebody else and a small wire, and you're trying to get the soul of that over that wire. And I don't think, and I think it's been proven with, with early video telecommunication systems, that unless you know that person, which therefore you kind of know their soul, you're not reading a lot into that because you have this, especially sometimes off a computer, because they're, bare, they're not very moving very much, right? So you're not getting as much data. So I would agree with you if you can compress their soul, which is a bit of a, which is some of this conversation about cognitively what is that, if it is in fact their soul today under particular lights using a camera with the baby crying in the background of a webcam, that's why I would disagree with you. That, that's more their soul. So in the case of scientists, 
which we're starting to do with the aquarium, I'll show you in a second. In fact, I will show you now. Um, so here's this, this bottom one. So if you go to a modern day aquarium, uh, there's stuff. I mean, museums, art museums, and aquarium and zoos, there's things. Those are Mona Lisa or, or, or a whale or, or, or a carved mask. And there's a sign next to it. And people are not always reading the sign because this is research we're doing. It's an informal learning space. Um, how could we make those signs come alive? How can we can make that more emotionally uh, involved? Uh, one way is you go to the aquarium. There's a cool Ridley turtle. And you could say, gee whiz, I wish I could know more about that turtle. I wish the, the, the best expert in the world on that turtle was, in fact, here in front of me now. Um, so your thing is, well, he's somewhere. <laughs> Let's get a camera on him and see what he does. I would claim he's somewhere as a scientist. And in fact, the reason there's, you know, there were certain kinds of people like Dawkins and, and, uh, and, and, and Carl, what was Carl's last name? Uh, there are scientists who can talk about science and ones that prefer to do science. And they surely don't like to comb their hair. They don't like to actually have cameras on them. So I claim that's not who they are. And in fact, the data coming off their face is probably not the best way to do it. Those scientists, and this is the work we're doing, those scientists, though, do field recordings all the time. So that's voice. So I'm trying not to bother them, get a little bit of their soul, because it does come out in their voice. And in fact, they don't even use recordings anymore. They use laptops, and they record right there. So we're doing something with the Vancouver Aquarium where we're taking that. And uh, every two weeks, they talk. It goes to the aquarium. They, you know, uh, museums have very little production staff. They can't even afford video, you know, good looking video systems. Um, they take that, they listen to it, they type it in, they clean it up, they put it with 10 other voice things, and then within an hour, it's out on the show floor. So they can say, hey, I heard it's raining up there in Silicon Valley, if it's, if it's a local place here. It rains all the time down here. So really current stuff, the soul of what he's really trying to say, I would at least argue with, that might be a better way to do it. And it's more private and secure. The, it's not his job to to, he, he might want to be anonymous when he walks through the aquarium. We could put him on a, as it says here, a constructed persona. It's kind of the scientist, and it's kind of the educational staff. And there's some ethics of where that deals with. So I completely agree with what you're saying, in some ways. But my pushback is at least my talk pushback, which is it's about perception. And there's ways to play with perception to make a better hit. There's also ways to play with that emphasizing th some things and de-emphasizing things like what they really look like and that they're sweaty in the Amazon, right? That, that, that might be important, might not be. Um, but that's worthwhile doing. Um, so in the case, that's exactly what we're doing with this kind of work. With this one, we can have a uh, native artist actually uh, talk about their mask, turn into their mask. Most native carvers are actually performers too, so they can perform right into it. So these are, these are ways um, to, to deal with this side of, so why is all this, at least this side of it, and I'm going to go on to some things that I think are more relevant to the, to the audience, is at least um, trying to talk about social communication versus info. So very clear, if you're at an aquarium or a zoo, it is really hard to read any sign. You got this, this you, know, you have the coolest you know, tiger looking at you, and you're supposed to read this sign. It's not going to work. You have your kid pulling on you. You barely can look up the sign that says, what time the beluga show is next. So to think you could do other things, it's trickly. So can we keep you in a social space? Because that's what you're in. And instead, bring a scientist in and says, hey, I see you looking at the turtle. I'm actually down here in the Amazon. So this is a, this is a way to do it. It's more of a programmed way. I would claim that the video way is one way, but it's, it's sharp into a cinematography kind of way where this, this at least way is changeable and programmable. So I do want to keep moving on in the AI side of this. So once now, so I got a face system that, that is programmed and understands emotion. And I showed it to you very quick. If you're more interested, plenty of other demos, uh, a lot of uh, work in a number of areas. We're working with autism right now, with uh, autism folks trying to understand uh, using a face system there. Uh, sorry, my computer's just wigging out here for a sec. I want to show you uh, how once data is in a parameterized way, 
uh, you can remap it to other data. So this is specifically, I would call it an aesthetic stream. Like music is, an, is it's a stream because it moves through. You're here at one particular time, and it's aesthetic because it means things to you. Animation is similar. I can now uh, write a system that I can extract. In this case, I'm trying to extract emotion out of music. Tons of papers on emotion and music. Uh, Lance and I was talking that COPE here in UC SC is, is really strong on it. Uh, how could we quantify some of that information so we can pull it out? Uh, everyone has seen a painting that seems kind of moody but heroic. And there's a person you can imagine who's moody or heroic. Can you extract moody and heroicness out? And for some period of time, is it sitting in some Heisenberg box where you could you know, actually have moody and emotion separated for a second and then move it to anything you want? So uh, I'm using music. The emotion is the stream, and it's going to emotional face. But it could be anything. I'll show you what that looks like. Again, sometimes when I'm making a system and it's fun, but not sure how accurate, I call that art. And, and uh, it goes to an art show. And this was at uh, SIGGRAPH in LA. And this was in a big gallery in New York, or at least one version of them. Uh, but I learned things from it, and that goes back to my other system. Because to produce it for art, you have to make somewhat of a rigorous system. So. So let me show you that. So this is a fuzzy logic rule-based system that ex extracts emotion based on, you know, again, rules, fuzzy rules, because it's not very clear. And they conflict. And again, we've proven with, with Craig Reynolds and Flock and Verding that simple rules that conflict with each other make nice, complex data, but sometimes controllable. So this is a string quartet. So that's four different stringed instruments. All of them are creating this face. Nobody hand animated this face. And I'm going to stop it and tell you just quickly, because it's going to come. In music, especially Western music, it's all about getting home. Home is, is getting back to the root. The more you go dissident, you go off the, the third and the fifth. It's dissonant. But then you go home, and it's nice. So that's a kind of a standard thing. If you decide on your way home, to go home high rather than low, that can come up as you might call it angelic, which is da 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 da. So he ended high rather than low. So uh, uh, we wrote the system that you could map that. That's been mapped to face angelic. We could do research on what that really means. In the case, we can give it to an artist and say, it's a tool. You decide. In that case, angelic is uh, feel this, pull your head back, close your eyes, feel the sun. And I think he did it slightly differently. So that'll just show up. I don't know where it's going to show up. You play different music, it'll show up in a different place. It's pretty complex stuff. It's tracked four different tracks. So right here. Da, 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 da. So that's why the eyes close. New piece da, 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 is closing the eyes. It's in a major key. It's staying smiling. It's going to go out of that. It's going to go a little bit more awe key. So the mouth opens in a different kind of case. So there's a lot more on this, too. This is Rev 1 of a number of them. It brings up this issue. I would call it, in, 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 in worlds that you might be at more than I'm in, it's a form of knowledge mashup, right? Rather than kind of straight, you know, either pixel mashup or, or data mashup, it's bring it semantically up and then mash it up at, at some semantic level. If you can agree on this remap, like here's the mashup right here, right? Um, papers on that, it's useful for gaming. By the way, it's, it's, uh, the, the current application is uh, in Vancouver, there's a really great theater, very modern. Vancouver's an average size city, somewhat like San Jose is, let's say. Um, so there's a million of these really cool, innovative theaters that wish they could be more than they currently are. Um, but they can't compete with London and New York with animatronics and fireworks. So, you know, they rent out a lot of the songs and the costumes. The talk is now, let's get them digital projectors. And we'll have maybe some movable scrim, they call it, but movable fabric or, or something to project on. And then the entire set is now programmed. In fact, you could rent that too, right? So that's the idea. So this brings in this idea of, re as it says there, reactive uh, NPR or reactive set design, that just like an actor or, or um, a dancer might change things slightly every night based on the music, this is possible with a system like this, too. Uh, I'm going to move on to um, uh, neural networks and action selection and where that fits. So these are beluga whales. We have a lot of work on this. Uh, uh, it's uh, an advanced layer. That's the action selection system. Um, whales and dolphins are quite tricky. They actually. Um, 
are hard. Uh, uh, and one of the reasons they're hard is because they have no idle state. They really are in a constant state of, of, um, of correction, which makes them really fast, but really hard to make. So we actually, in our physically based animation system, um, that was a, um, a drag based system, which is really good for planes and flocking, anything that seems to, stuff comes out the back and it moves and it banks, that's good. We go to the aquarium, we look at these huge whales, this whale's hanging up upside down, just hanging out and kind of doing, going, oh, the, it's never gonna work. We moved over to a lift based system. It's much harder to control, looks a little bit better. So um, this is the way the action selection system is. There's other belugas, there's dynamic objects that the audience uh, number one thing at the aquarium with whales is to swim with the whales. That's what it says on the surveys. Can't really have them do it. What if the whales can tell their story? You see something the whale does, you go to the other side of the room, and you could actually try it out. You could do what if. Um, so quickly to decide, do I got to collide with it? Well, you know, because I got to hurry and do that, because I really do think like that. They're constantly, that you got to get right to the, like we have a very quick neural net to how I move, and I can show you that in a second. But it's also, no, I don't, but it is, my brother, or my cat, or the Exxon Valdez bearing down on me. So it's important, then an object, it decides based on, gee whiz, it is an aggressive male, but I'm, you know, really, I really need to take a breath. Um, and then it goes into an action selection state. So um, uh, the neural net is the fast one. It might not be too easy to see. There's these rays coming out. These rays are literally go right into the net because it's just got to be fast. So this, this advanced layer sends in, uh, I'm, this is the way I'm moving, uh, uh, a sensor ray, very quick logic to say, how could I avoid things? And of course, they don't just see things and avoid, they actually turn around and do some really nice, nice thing. And it's affected by speed, so it, it actually stretches out but gets less resolution as they're going faster, which is something we learned really happens. Um, Nice thing is once it looks good, we can start doing the magic. We can turn it off and show you how the heart beats or how the sonar works. So, this is done in conjunction with Bill Krauss, who's an evolutionary biologist turned programmer, turned NASA uh, genetic programmer at NASA. He lives up in Tahoe. And he's done most of the, the genius with this, and more the animation design guy. Oh, you got it on two screen. Um, so this is gonna go into the Vancouver Aquarium soon. It's gonna be huge. Scale matters. The bigger you show this, the cooler it looks. So when people think that scale, just because scale is quote free in computer systems doesn't mean it doesn't affect. So this is not a movie, this is uh, 3D wells. They live in a world of sound. First story is, is just done. That, set, that, that interesting enough vision and sound are, are a continuum with a well. There almost is, there's very little differences. They see things, if they put on echolocation, that means they get more detail in their sight. We don't actually think it's separate. So in fact, if you're, if you're a, a school of zebra fish and you do your thing to be confusing, they wham on their uh, echolocation. <laughs> they see the masses inside you. So all of a sudden they can make out your slightly bigger or slower one pretty rectally. By the way, the second they turn on echolocation, everyone else sees that same thing. Because in fact, so it's kind of weird because we don't think like that. Um, Vision, private. Echolocation vision, everyone sees it. And you're basically saying, hey, there's a big juicy one here, so you don't turn it on until it matters. By the way, they dropped, they dropped uh, these uh, little uh, steel balls that have different, very, very different hollow, and they give them treats based on it. They immediately can tell the difference between steel balls all the time. So when people, you know, you see these new shows, I just saw one, is, is do animals have a sixth sense to know about when earthquakes happen? You know, more at 11. It's like, no, they have the same senses turned on differently. It's not magic, it's not weirdness. It's, you know, there's no difference between, uh, you know, uh, same thing, sound is the same thing as feeling also with these animals as well too. So, um, so I'll show you a little bit what's going on here that we can move this, I can click on this ball and move them toward me, the females which are here, will come near me. The calf will try and keep up, but can't. It will do its, its scream, which actually came from real whales at the aquarium. All this is based on real data. We have an aggressive male here. 
uh, it's probably this guy. Yeah, I can almost tell by the way he turns. He will, he will go after like he's going to go right now. And bump gear yeah, just shot game. <laughs> Kef is spinning around, which would be too much. It wouldn't normally do that. So we're building this up more and more. Eventually, this is going to be in the aquarium. The real one's going to be on one side. We're going to make a table. On the table, you could put this stuff down. Um, how does this really work? Tell me about these words and sentences thing again. I will click on the mail and turn off. It's automatic. So I just, there he is. He just stopped dead in front of us because uh, he's under my control now. Um, uh, <laughs> He becomes invisible, so they start going right through him. The sad one is if you do this to the, fe the female that the calf is following, the calf just spins around because the calf's sensor knows it's there but just doesn't see it. So anyway, so I'm going to stop it. So I just stopped, and I'm going to go forward, and I'm going to go reverse, and maybe pitch right or left. I can affect the head controller. So when I do talk about a space, because normally you don't think of action selection in a space, this is the low level space. This is how belugas get from A to B and do some thinking. On that, we're building up. All, originally, they all did the same thing. Then eventually, we made sure one was more aggressive, and that was a male. And the one followed and had an issue. And that was, um, uh, and that was mom. So I'm going to finish off with talking a little bit about creativity, moving up. OK, so I want to mention one quick thing before I go into creativity is uh, two kinds of visualization. You can scream at me. I'm just trying to make it easy. One is scientists know about it, and they want to teach regular people. We call that like the weather. There really is no L and H, but it's a good way to explain it to folks. There's another kind of scientific visualization is we don't know about it. And we're trying to visualize it so we can get that. That would be oil exploration. You want to keep the oil exploration real data. So if something shoots out, it didn't come from like you know, it didn't. It, you know, it's right. You want to keep this stuff. Um, good looking wells don't get that close together. They don't do certain things. But you want to teach lessons. We're claiming that this system is right in between. That we can do both. That there are things that scientists can do. And I think one, so I got a chance to be at Google. One thing that I'd at least a little bit push is. This could be, so, so the, uh, that baby whale that cried, that crying came up from a one-year-old. She died at the age of three last year. No one knows why. Big protests. Should they really have mammals in captivity? Huge ethical issues. Um, could we possibly put sensors some in the wired while of a beluga or frag the tiger and actually make one of these systems? So this would be your issue was, is video enough? I would claim, no, 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 we want to censor these other things, but that's a space. I was actually suggesting that you use an important device to. Uh... Sorry, I was actually suggesting that, that video was not the important thing and that you use this as a recording device to get at the essence of what's going on okay. and transmit those things. Okay, yes. good. Thanks. You both helped me to make that other weird point. And this one, which is even the better one, which is I do think, so they have now things called cable labs. You know, they used to go out into the deep. Um, ocean and film everything. Now they go out to the deep ocean, put in this thing, and uh, go back home <laughs> here and just watch all the stuff. So I believe they haven't started it, but I believe they will start doing it with data. So again, I think there's other applications that might happen in buildings like this where you could take data from other places, uh, put it into an intelligent system, think a little bit about its learning and entertainment value. Again, the belugas don't get that close, but if you, you would need it to see it, uh, and use it that way. So on that, taking data and maybe playing with it a little bit is this last point, which is on creativity. So back to genetic programs. So uh, GP is, uh, you have a function set. Uh, you ran, again, very quick. You randomly put that in individuals. You test blindly those individuals in another room, uh, the ones that do well move on and those strategies go. To, and that's in a space. It's a way to search through a space. Well, that's good for optimization. But I was interested in exploration, getting to a computer to be creative. So what we did is, again, just went to the, the new cognitive psych data. What's going on in, in, a, in human creativity? Everyone knows creative people have a very associative. They're putting them under FRMRI scanners now. And it turns out, again, if I was to make uh, a mic, I'd say, oh, a mic, that's sound waves. Sound waves is like the waves in the ocean. I'm going to make something that looks like a wave. Um, that's an associative way. Not everyone does that. Everyone knows that. The other thing that 
um, creative people do, though, is they go doggedly focused. And they say, I'm not washing my hair. I'm not doing anything. I'm just solving this. And then they go wide again. And if you could ever figure out how they do that, you can do a, a number of things. So this is one attempt at that based on the research. So we decided to only do portrait space. And a, a little bit of the art side is that it's Darwin himself um, uh, using Dar So we're using this very famous picture of Darwin. And we're using Darwinian techniques to get the ghost out of the machine, the ghost being creativity, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, by the way, this image just get, got in the journal Nature in, a, in an article on Darwin. So at least that, that, that cycle made some kind of sense. So in this case, uh, uh, one thing about art is quite wide and hard to do. OK, okay I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end in one minute. Sound good? 50 seconds? Oh, 30 seconds? Now? Um, so I'll just leave you with the, um, this tries to go wide um, in an art space and go thin and kind of deal with that fluidity. Um, there, we have a new paper on this in, that's just coming out in genetic programming and evolved machines. And if you're interested, you should look at that. I think, well, we did it in this kind of fun art space that it's quite useful in a, in, in a number of spaces. We're doing it uh, in a more detailed way for art. And now I have a cognitive art system that can take a regular picture and start doing paintings, not just like a painting of a particular style, of any style, because I'm, I'm trying to uh, model cognitive space of painters. So these are some of the results I'm getting. There's a paper on that if you want to look at it. Uh, 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 what that shows and what the entire talk shows is that uh, artists know how to take data and de-emphasize what isn't important and emphasize what is. And while reality likes not to do that, I think that's a good approach in all these systems. And I find making spaces and using AI systems allows me to do that. Thank you very much.